Tonight, a fire in Cat Lake First Nation leaves them without a nursing station. It warms my heart. A Mohawk violinist gets a big break with the classical orchestra of Montreal. On the coding platform we're using, we get to use their music and like voices and beats and all that to create our own music so we can like sh try to use our voice as power. And a creative way for students to learn how to code. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. Cat Lake First Nation is in a state of crisis after the remote community in northern Ontario lost its nursing station following a fire on Saturday night. Nishnabi Askey Police Service confirmed that a fire broke out at the Margaret Gray nursing station. Chief Russell Wesley declared a local state of emergency. People with specific medical needs like cancer and diabetes were evacuated on Monday. An investigation is ongoing. In a social media post, Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu said the federal government will be at the community's side during this difficult moment, so they have everything they need. A former White Horse Hotel is getting a facelift, and more than 60 supportive housing units are part of the package. The former High Country Inn building will be converted into a permanent 67-unit supportive housing project called the Hearth. The building is owned by nonprofit Safe at Home Society, which is currently operating the building as a temporary housing project for 28 residents. Yukon government says it will provide up to $12.9 million to renovate the building. Once construction is completed in February 2026, 75% of all units will be allocated to Indigenous peoples. Safe at Home Society Executive Director Kate Meechan says the project is a win for people experiencing chronic homelessness. 80% of those who are experiencing homelessness are chronically homeless, so it means they've been homeless for really, really long time. It's, it's enduring in and out of shelters, in and out of transitional housing and different sort of treatment, hospital, correctional center. So this is going to provide some stability in the downtown core and um, we're pretty excited about that. Federal government has signed two agreements worth over $35 million with the Nunavut government in the federal health, minister, health minister's first visit to the territory. The first is a $25 million contribution toward Inuit recruitment and training to help increase the number of Inuit working in primary care, as well as expanding specialized mental health and addiction services by recruiting more Inuit health professionals. The second is a $12 million contribution toward improving elder care in the next five years. Mark Holland is the federal health minister. Today we're also signing a second agreement, which is uh, an Aging with Dignity agreement uh, that will see more than 12 million uh, go to Nunavut over the next five years. Uh, this is funding uh, that is really going to help uh, people uh, age close to home. Uh, I was so proud that we were able, John, to see the federal investment in the long-term care facility uh, here. I believe it's $25 million that the federal government placed forward um, to help folks. Uh, and we know that, you know, like I was saying earlier, uh, when people have made a contribution over their whole life to their communities, uh, they should uh, have the opportunity to age and, uh, and, and spend their whole lives in their communities. Well, we always want to hear from you on anything you see or hear here. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, you can send us an email to news at apten.ca or to read and watch our stories, go to our website. That's aptnnews.ca. You can also find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. Last week, Phoenix, a violin concerto by Quebec composer Louis Bavin, made its North American premiere in Montreal. Ganawage-born violinist Tara Louise Montour 
was chosen to be the soloist for this one night only event. Maricela Amador has more. I initiate the bird call. Little by little, musician by musician, they, they take up that bird call. For Mohawk violinist Tara Louise Montour, it was an honor to perform the solo in Phoenix, a violin concerto presented by the Classical Orchestra of Montreal. But it came with a major challenge. The concerto had only been performed once in France back in 2015, and it had never been recorded. When I got the score, I was working from, from scratch and just having to figure out the whole thing. And definitely, it's, it's a process. Like, it's a slow, uh, rather steep learning curve to, you know, make my way through the music. However, she said that being able to discuss things through with composer Louis Babin made the difficult process easier. We had our first rehearsal a couple of days ago with the orchestra, and it was the first time that I'd heard it. All together. So that was an amazing experience because a lot made sense all of a sudden. Um, and, and there were a few surprises too. The story of Phoenix is one of death and rebirth. And Babin believes most people would be able to relate to it. J'ai eu beaucoup de, je dirais, de changements de tangente dans ma vie. Et je crois que ça touche beaucoup de monde. C'est pas tout le monde qui va avoir le cancer, mais il y en a beaucoup qui vont avoir à changer de travail qui vont changer de lieu, qui vont changer de milieu de vie, etc. Alors pour moi, c'est ce que ça représente Phoenix. The composer added that he was very grateful that the Classical Orchestra of Montreal agreed to present the concert as part of its programming, even though a recording wasn't available. Taras Kulish, the director general of the Classical Orchestra of Montreal, said that the story and music complement each other and really draw people in. Ça fait partie de notre mission de présenter des artistes, des compositeurs autochtones au moins une fois par année. Et donc cette année, on a choisi Tara Louise. Many of Montour's community members from Ganawage attended the concert. I'm very happy to have the support from the community because yes, it has been it has been a long road of of, you know, concerts leading up to this, this type of event and it is definitely it warms my heart. Maricela Amador, APTN National News, Montreal. Really cool stuff there for Montour. Congrats to her for that. Time to step aside for a quick break. Coming up, a First Nations artist from the Yukon is channeling her personal experiences with grief and loss into a new art exhibit. The tent itself is a um, uh, metaphor for talking about grief, um, especially around substance use disorder. Welcome back. Grief and loss are things we all experience at some point. Now, First Nations artist from the Yukon is channeling her personal experiences with grief, loss, and mourning through a new art exhibit in Whitehorse. Here's Sarah Connors with a look. The tent itself is a um, uh, metaphor for talking about grief, um, especially around substance use disorder. White River First Nation artist Teresa Vandermeer Chasse has lost many loved ones in recent years. Now she's inviting audiences to witness the universal cycles of loss, grief, and mourning through her new exhibit, Shayitza, Crying in the Heart. It debuted Thursday at the Yukon Art Center and Whitehorse. It's a very personal and vulnerable um, exhibition in some ways. For this piece, um, my grandpa gave me this pillow the exhibit is a collection of three installations. The first is in remembrance of her maternal great-grandmother. It recounts the discovery of finding half of her great-grandmother's house robe used as stuffing in a pillow she crocheted. 
Vandermeer Chasse added embroidery and beadwork to the robe and used Atlantic salmon skin to reconstruct it. It also features the many tea bags used to dye the salmon skin. And uh, this work is never going to be complete. It's, it's supposed to be a piece about um, kind of taking it and working on it whenever I have an exhibition. Audiences can then weave their way to what she calls Worms Shower Among Us. Using yarn, Vandermeer Chasse reflects on an ancient story passed down through her family about witnessing a volcanic eruption. The story that we have, which is amazing because it's 1500 years old, um, is that uh, it was kind of, there was so much ash that it looked like uh, what they said was fuzzy black worms falling from the sky. Vandermeer Chasse put her own touch on the piece by using rabbit fur for the worms. To incorporate ash, she used charcoal from a recent wildfire near her home community of Beaver Creek and cigarette butts from her late grandmother. For her, the work is personal. The hanging structure that I've kind of created um, talks a little bit about uh, uh, kind of death itself. Yeah, let's go inside. It's nice and bright in here too. Perhaps the most striking installation is this repurposed wall tent salvaged from Vandermeer Chasse's traditional territory. The piece touches on her personal experiences with loss due to substance use disorder. So there's texts that I've embroidered or beaded and things like that all around. And these are messages that I sent to family members who have passed away um, with a substance use disorder or have a substance use disorder, and I'm talking about a passing. Um, the exhibit runs until May 17th. Vandermeer Chasse hopes audiences will find meaning in its message. So it's just more of adapting uh, to a new life that you, um, to a new reality, to, to a new uh, lived experience that you have after the loss of a very close uh, loved one. Sarah Connors, APTN National News, Whitehorse. Striking work. Well, when you think of coding, hip hop may not be one of the first things that pops into your head. But hundreds of students were at the University of Calgary to learn about computer coding and doing it with Indigenous hip hop artists. APTN's Chris Stewart has the story on Your Voice is Power. Cree hip hop artist Dakota Bear is lending his music for use so students can take his vocals and beats and use a unique program called EarSketch to remix his songs to create their own unique music. The program is called Your Voice is Power, presented by Taking It Global and Amazon Future Engineer Program. Inspire award-winning educator Marika Shala helped bring the U.S.-based program to Canada and added Indigenous artists and teachings to it. So they take little stems from our future artists, Dakota Bear, Jaylee Wolf, Simeon, and Twin Flames. And they use different percussion and piano and guitar strings to create a beautiful song that has a message of social justice change. Like what call to action can I use in my song to bring a new message? Julie Demiersman is a grade nine student. She admits she had no interest in coding until she got here. Today was actually really, really fun because we got to meet three Indigenous artists, right? And on the coding platform we're using, we get to use their music and like voices and beats and all that to create our own music so we can like sh try to use our voice as power. The week-long program offers eight modules from computer sciences, debugging, and mixing to social issues like racism, residential schools, and decolonization. Teachers can run the free program in their classrooms or at the larger hackathons like this one in Calgary. Junior high and high school kids can take their music and enter them into a competition to win one of two $5,000 scholarships to a university or a college. I've seen a lot of creativity come out from this. I've seen a lot of, of, of youth being able to use their skills and talents and even form new skills and passions. The program wants to engage 20,000 students and teachers this year in Canada. Teachers can register at yourvoiceispower.ca.
Chris Stewart, ABTN National News, Edmonton. Torres Strait Islanders are concerned about the effects climate change is having, both above and below the water surface. Nestled between the international waters of Indonesia and the Pacific, the Torres Strait is revered for having some of the best managed fisheries in the world. Traditional fishermen have welcomed a new project that will investigate the impacts of climate change on sea country. Here's a report from Australia's NITV's Carly Williams, Willis. Harry Nona grew up on Badu Island and his family have been navigating these waters for generations. As a diver, I can see the changes underneath the water. Only the divers can see that. I'm a full-time fisherman. I've seen it, uh, how the sand shift from the bottom and it's no longer craze sitting on the area where the bottom of the feeding ground where they feed and where they come in for shelter. Torres Strait Islanders will work with leading national science organisation, CSIRO, to map out climate change impacts on fisheries. Fisheries uh, is very important for our economic livelihood, our own sustenance and survival, and continuing our cultural practices of harvesting uh, marine resources sustainably and into the future. The project will use 3D modelling to look at future impacts. The models are actually fitted to sort of historical data to be able to kind of validate them to be able to then predict um, into the future under different climate change scenarios. The project focuses on species of great importance to fisheries industries in the region, including crayfish, sea cucumber, seagrass and finfish. But in a first also takes into focus the culturally significant dugong. Six of the world's seven species of turtle live or migrate to the Torres Strait, another culturally significant animal. For two years now, there's no, um, no mating turtle. Wow. Uh, I, I'm worried about future generation. If, they, if I don't see no turtle mating, well, we will have problem with in the islands where turtle can lay eggs. Cyro says project time and funding has limited the amount of species the project can focus on initially, but there's hope the project will pave the way for more species in future. Some species can handle some increase in temperature, but when you start pushing that too far, there are a lot of, a lot of different, um, I guess, parts that this temperature can influence. It can influence the growth, can influence, you know, changes in, in reproduction. Cyro says traditional knowledge is key. We want to ha ensure that our knowledges are, are valued and acknowledged as scientists ourselves. Ensuring culture and economy for generations to come. Carly Willis, NITV News. Thanks to our partners at NITV for that. A hockey team that fields players from Nunavut and northern Manitoba has been saved. Details on that and more still to come. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Victor Chagas uh, found himself under softly lit blue clouds in Winnipeg, Manitoba as the sun descended for the evening. Beautiful shot there, Victor. Thanks for that. Be sure to send us your pictures to share at aptn.ca if you'd like to be featured as our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at Wednesday's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 10 in Halifax and Fredericton. Minus 17 with snow in Kujuwak, flurries and 11 below in Nain. 14 above in Montreal, sun's out and plus 2 in Val d'Or. Six above with the sun out in Sault Ste. Marie, a sunny high of five in North Bay. Plus two for Thunder Bay and Sioux Lookout. Minus nine in God's Lake, seven below in Norway House. Zero with snow for Winnipeg, minus 10 in Flurries and Dauphin. Minus 12 for Regina with snow, snow and 16 below in Saskatoon. Minus 14 in Meadow Lake, Buffalo Narrows and LaRange. Setting across northern Alberta, minus 12 in high level, 13 below in Fort Chippewa. Minus 13 and sunny for Edmonton, snow and minus 5 in Lethbridge. 
A cloudy 6 above for Vancouver, sunny and 2 in Kamloops. Minus 5 for Prince George, snow and minus 4 in Smithers. Minus 20 with snow in Old Crow, 7 below and snow in Whitehorse. Minus 16 with flurries in Yellowknife, minus 15 in Norman Wells. 28 below in Saks Harbor, minus 30 in Politak. Minus 31 in Baker Lake, 36 below for Cambridge Bay. Minus 31 in Resolute, 34 below in Joe Haven. Good news last week came for the Norman North Stars AAA hockey team who were facing potential removal from their league. The Manitoba Under-18 Hockey League board voted down a motion to change its team's borders, which would have potentially removed the Norman North Stars from the league. In recent months, there was speculation and concern surrounding the team's future. The North Stars have been around since the 1980s with many Indigenous players from as far away as Nunavut going on to have long careers in hockey. In a statement from Manitoba, Kuwait, and Aoki Mackinac Grand Chief Garrison Sati, MKO applauds the decision, saying the team is essential for hockey development. Thrill seekers on Vancouver Island bared it all for a good cause. This was the naked bungee jumping fundraiser in Nanaimo. Yikes, uh, you heard that right. Jumpers stripped down to their birthday suit, then took turns and plunged down 45 meters over the Nanaimo River. They were able to raise a whopping $87,000 for local mental health charities. Great cause. I am absolutely terrified of heights and would never do that, uh, even with my clothes on. Less terrifying for me are aliens, and it would seem the truth is still out there. There were more than 500 reports of unidentified flying objects across Canada last year. Most of the sightings were of unexplained lights in the sky. Higher populated provinces typically reported more sightings, with Quebec and Ontario leading the way. Data was collected from sightings reported to official government agencies, private organizations, and social media. That looked real there. A Métis man who lost his son to an accidental fentanyl poisoning last year hopes to spread his anti-drug message across Canada. Joseph Foray's son Harlan suffered a catastrophic brain injury after taking drugs tainted with fentanyl. Coming up tonight on Face to Face, Foray, who is a recovering addict himself, says it was a difficult decision to start speaking out following his son's death. I was angry at the way that fentanyl was, was just running wild, you know, in the streets killing our youth and nobody was talking about it. So we started talking about it. And I remember our first trip we took up north. Um, we were in Cross Lake and uh, I start questioning myself, like, why am I doing this? And I'm ripping off the Band-Aid every time I go up and talk about hard and talk about what happened. And there was this young 14-year-old boy who came and gave me the, <laughs> the biggest hug. And uh, he looked at me and he said, thank you for trying to save our lives and giving us this information because we didn't know. You can watch our entire interview with Joseph in less than a minute's time. That is all the time we have for you tonight. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy McGwitch. Have a great night.